I'll start with uh, the last section of this course. Um, I hope that it has been so far uh, as exciting and instructive as it has been for me. And I hope you'll also have fun in this last section, uh, which is dedicated to uh, deep generative networks in single cell transcriptomics. And before I start, um, I'll introduce myself. So my name is Panagiotis Papasaikas. I'm a computational biologist, um, a research associate at the Friedrich Mieser Institute. So um, I'm a colleague with uh, uh, Michael Stadler and Charlotte Sonneson. Um, and mainly I'm working on transcriptomic data, uh, single cell data, developing computational methods uh, for the analysis of such data. Um, and uh, I have an interest since uh, a few years now in deep learning methods uh, that are applicable to, um, to single cell analysis. Okay, so let's see how this uh, section is going to go. So this is the overview. Uh, I'm going to start with um, a brief introduction to uh, the TensorFlow uh, and uh, Keras uh, backends for uh, deep learning and machine learning analysis. Uh, then I'll do uh, a short introduction to uh, deep learning and what we mean by deep learning. Uh, at that point, uh, we'll stop to have the first exercise, which is um, implementing a very simple model, uh, which is called the multi-layer perceptron in Keras. And we'll see uh, how these models can be, how this model can be implemented uh, either in the, uh, using the R Keras API or the Python Keras API. And after we're done with the exercise, uh, around the time we'll have the first break, depending on how we're doing on time. And uh, after that, we're going to come back. Um, we'll continue on the theoretical presentation, talking about deep generative networks, and more specifically, uh, variational autoencoders and variational inference, and briefly about uh, adversarial networks, generative adversarial networks. Uh, I'll mention some uh, existing applications and tools um, that use deep generative networks in single cell transcriptomics. And uh, then we'll move to the second exercise, which is the longer exercise, uh, where we'll be doing uh, variational inference in, uh, in Keras and specifically using the R API for Keras. Um, and again, depending on how we're doing our time, at some point, um, probably during the second exercise, we'll have uh, the second break. Then we'll come back after that break, and um, hopefully around five uh, will be done, and then we'll have uh, the closing comments for the course. Okay. So uh, we start with a short introduction on TensorFlow and Keras. So what is TensorFlow? TensorFlow is an open source general purpose numerical computing library. Uh, so it was not developed uh, specifically for deep learning. So it has more general optimization libraries, such as libraries that uh, implement gradient descent um, or adapt adaptive optimizers that uh, are used um, in more general optimization problems. It was originally developed by the engineers in the Google Brain team that uh, were conducting machine le uh, learning research. And of course, with the advent of, of, uh, of deep learning and its popularity, it, uh, it took off and it has become probably the uh, most used uh, backend for uh, deep learning research. Um, it is hardware dependent, so uh, any code that you write on TensorFlow can uh, work either on uh, CPU hardware or on GPUs um, or uh, if you have access to those, you can also work to the uh, deep learning specific hardware that was uh, developed by Google, which are the TPUs. And another advantage of TensorFlow is that it supports large data sets and distributed execution. So it's a very uh, powerful framework for uh, machine learning and deep learning analysis. Uh, what are the model building blocks in TensorFlow? Uh, but also in Keras, because Keras is uh, nothing more but uh, a high-level API that actually uses the TensorFlow uh, backend. 
So uh, the, the, in terms of, of, of data objects, the building block are uh, tensors, and tensors are uh, just multidimensional arrays. So in this table, I have uh, some examples of, of, of uh, specific data types um, and how they correspond to uh, specific tensors and how this would be represented as R objects. So for example, if you just have a vector of cell labels, this would be uh, a one dimensional tensors, tensor in TensorFlow. Uh, and in, as an R object, this would just be a vector. If you have a gene count matrix, that would correspond to a 2D uh, tensor, uh, where the samples would be on the rows and uh, the genes would be the columns. And of course, in R, this would be uh, a matrix. If you have longitudinal um, uh, expression data, gene expression data, then we'll be talking about a 3D tensor, uh, where you have again samples in the rows and then in the other two dimensions, you would have the genes and the timestamp. And in the R object, that could be represented as a 3D array. Uh, you have microscopy images uh, that uh, would be uh, a 4D tensor because there you have samples, you have the height and the width of uh, each picture, and also you have the channels. So, the, uh, for example, the RGB channels, the color channels on which you are recording, uh, on which you are taking the pictures. And in R, this would be represented as a 4D array. And finally, if you have uh, video data, that would be, for example, a 5D array, where again, samples would be the first dimension, then you have the height, the width, and the channel um, for each picture. And of course, because again, you have a timestamp, um, you have also the frame. So that would be a 5D array. Uh, please, if you have uh, any question, um, either raise your hand, um, or you can also interrupt me or post it on the, on the group chat. Uh, so that I can view it. Okay. So, apart from the tensors, um, an important building block for the models in TensorFlow and Keras are layers, and layers are basically just units of numerical computations. In TensorFlow, uh, these are implemented by TensorFlow uh, operations, uh, which actually perform these these numerical computations. Uh, this uh, transformation functions on the tensors. Uh, and these functions are typically uh, parameterized by weights. So for example, an addition or a matrix multiplication and sampling or taking gradients is uh, a TensorFlow operation or uh, a Keras layer. Um, and here, for, uh, for example, you can see um, a very uh, simple scenario where you have uh, three different in inputs that are parameter parameterized by a specific weights. Uh, then you take the summation of those, so this would be um, a transformation function, it would be a Keras layer. Uh, you're adding some uh, bias term, and then these uh, uh, are, uh, are going to give you your output. Finally, you can combine uh, layers, layers and tensors in order to construct computational graphs. Uh, typically, these are uh, direct, direct acyclic graphs, but uh, not necessarily. Uh, but usually, that is the case. Uh, in this graph, uh, the nodes are the layers, so the computations, and the edges are the tensors. So uh, the tensors, your multidimensional arrays, are flowing through the computational graph. Transformations are happening to them and hopefully they're doing something useful. So this is the uh, schematic that you see here, where the tensors are flowing through a graph where you have uh, specified um, uh, transformations that should happen on those tensors. And that's actually where TensorFlow is taking its name from, um, because uh, uh, tensors are flowing through the computational graph uh, in order to perform a useful task. If you have a fully specified graph from input to output, this is a model, okay? So the basic building blocks, again, uh, are tensors, which are your data, uh, the layers or TensorFlow operations that do the numerical computation, transformation functions on the data, and combinations of those specify a graph that are going to give you your uh, machine learning model. 
All right, so how about Keras? So as I mentioned earlier, Keras is just a high level API um, that can use TensorFlow as its backend, but not only TensorFlow, um, which provides basically convenient wrappers for commonly used layers or computational graphs. So if you have um, a transformation function that is a very commonly used uh, transformation function in deep learning, like for example, a, convolu a convolutional transformation um, uh, or an activation function, um, this is implemented in Keras as a specific layer. <clears throat> you can also have more uh, complex layers that combine different operations. Uh, and this is the case that I mentioned here where you have a more complex computational graphs uh, uh, representing Keras as layers. Uh, so you have a wrapper for a more complex uh, graph of layers and, and uh, of layer operations on tensors. So what I saw here is actually taken from the uh, our, our screenshots from the examples that we're going to, the first exercise example that we're going to uh, uh, to go through. Um, and what we're doing here is that we're defining uh, a model which is called a multi-layer perceptron. Uh, in this case, it's not actually multi-layer, it actually has only one hidden, hidden layer. Uh, so what uh, the structure of this graph is the following. You have an input layer, uh, which is constructing, constructed in order to uh, receive uh, as input uh, images, 28 by 28 images of, of uh, grayscale, uh, grayscale images of digits, which, is, which are coming from the uh, very commonly used MNIST dataset. These are actually, uh, the input is flattened out uh, to, uh, to uh, one dimensional uh, feature vector uh, per sample. Uh, so you have again uh, 28 by 28 784 pixels as the input um, they go through uh, a single uh, hidden layer uh, and then they produce an output so uh, it's a very uh, simple model uh, the, the the task that we'll, that we'll try to achieve with model is is digit classification so we'll try to predict uh, whether the input that we get from a specific MNIST image corresponds to uh, digit 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So the output has actually uh, 10 uh, different nodes, each node corresponding to, to one of the digits. And the code that I saw here is not actually uh, a chunk of the code that specifies the model. This is the whole code that specifies the complete model. So you can see that. Uh, with three or four lines, either in R on the top here or in Python, uh, you can specify a model that does something relatively uh, complex. And you can see that it's, it actually uh, performs really good, really well. Um, and that's why we say that Keras is, is a very high level API because it allows you to uh, abstract much of the um, underlying details of constructing the graph with TensorFlow and it allows you uh, very easy experimentation in order to uh, very quickly build and try uh, deep learning models. Uh, so uh, we'll see this in more detail in the exercises, but uh, the way that we uh, specify uh, the model is that basically we stack uh, uh, layers on top of each other. In the first layer, that is the input layer, we have to specify uh, the size of the input, which is 784 again. Um, for the next layers, we don't have to do that because the, the, the next layers can infer actually what, the, uh, what their input is going to be because we specify it here. So he, in the first layer, we specify the input, but we also specify how many units this layer has. So that implies that the input to the next layer is going to be the dimensionality of the units of the first layer. We specify a specific transformation function. In this case, it's an activation function that is called ReLU and, sorry, And the rel function I saw here at the bottom, uh, which basically takes the value of the input uh, for any value that's greater than uh, than zero, and uh, it's a zero if uh, the value of the input is zero or less. And um, uh, these uh, activation functions are going to give you uh, a new output that's going to be combined. And it's going to pass to the to the last layer of the model, the output layer, that has the ten nodes corresponding to the digits. There we have uh, a softmax 
softmax activation function that basically what it does is that uh, it gives you a probability so it divides the output by a partition function in order to make certain that what you can to get back is uh, uh, a probability function and uh, in each node what you have in the end is a probability that uh, the input that you show corresponds to a particular digit okay do you have any questions so far yeah i, I have a question mm -hmm. um, with the um, value act activation it seems that uh, it doesn't really work with negative values no no it works with negative values there the, but what it does is that if you have a negative value it's going to uh to get that value it's going to 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 drop it to zero yeah so somehow it gets rid of the negative values Exactly, it gets rid of them, but it's not that it doesn't work with negative uh, yeah. values. Okay. It actually expects that at some point it will get negative values, but if that is the case, it's going to return a zero. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think there is one more question from Martin. Yes? Yes, I just wanted to ask, uh, uh, in the Python code, we're actually importing now dense layer. Um, what are the other layers roughly, and uh, why are we using right now the dense one? Okay, so um, like I said, a, a layer in Keras is uh, basically any um, uh, transformation that you are going to perform on the data. Uh, and we're going to see in the examples uh, several of, of those transformations. So the dense layer just specifies that you have a fully connected layer um, uh, from the input to the uh, to the first set of uh, to the first hidden layer. So uh, every input is is uh, fully connected uh, to the hidden layer. That you have corrections for everything to everything, and this is what a dense layer is. But uh, uh, in terms of of uh, what are the possible layers that you can have in Keras, there is um, uh, as I said a, a huge variety because any numerical transformation that you do on the tensors uh, is actually implemented in Keras as a layer. So a layer is nothing more than, a, than a, a, a transformation that is done on the tensors. Actually, not any transformation, it has to be uh, a differentiable transformation on the data. And the reason is that if you don't have a differential transformation, you cannot, uh, 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 you cannot fit your model. Uh, you cannot do back propagation on the model, but this we're going to mention a little bit later. Okay, thank you. All right. So <clears throat> there is, of course, uh, life beyond TensorFlow and Keras. So as I mentioned, Keras is a, is a high-level API uh, that supports not only TensorFlow, but multiple uh, deep learning backends. So I think at this point, uh, the Keras uh, API specification supports also the CNO and CNTK uh, uh, deep learning uh, backends. So what this means is that basically you have the same type of abstraction, the exact, the exact same code that uh, you would use uh, independently of, of whether in the background, whether um, uh, in, 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 the, in the layers below, uh, the backend is using TensorFlow, CNO or CNTK uh, for the construction of, of uh, for the actual construction of the graph, um, but uh, apart from Keras, TensorFlow, Theno, and CNTK, there are also uh, other uh, machine learning frameworks um, that are supported by different companies. So, for example, for example, the CNTK that I mentioned before is supported by uh, by Microsoft. You have PyTorch, you have Gluon, uh, MXNet, Cafe2, uh, and Zener, and depending on uh, exactly what applications people are, are working on, uh, on what level uh, they're working on, if they are developers of models or, or end users, uh, and of course, uh, what are their connections to different companies, uh, people have different preferences. But I hope that the material that we're going to, to, to go over today um, is relatively general, so, so it does not really going to matter what's going to be your choice of, of uh, a deep learning backend. I hope that what you're going to learn today is going to be applicable no matter what you will end up using. Okay, <clears throat> so what is deep learning? Um, so deep learning models, they take uh, an input and transform it to an, out to an out 
output via successive layers of increasingly abstract and meaningful representations. So this is a very high level uh, description of what deep learning is. And I'm going to give here an example uh, to try to explain what I mean uh, by uh, these meaningful uh, representations. Suppose you have uh, this type of, uh, of raw data, uh, this uh, uh, two dimensional points um, that you try to separate uh, in two categories between the black and the white. So this is your task. This is what you, uh, you, what you try to achieve. Um, one transformation, uh, one useful transformation that you could do on the data would be a rotation. So basically a coordinate change, because if you do that, then basically what you can do, if you do that, the right uh, uh, rotation, what you can do is that basically you can use uh, an X value as the threshold for separating the two categories. So what we have done here is, is um, uh, a rotational transformation of the data that, uh, uh, that resulted in a different representation than the raw data that we had uh, to begin with that was useful for our task at hand, right? And in this case, the task that we had was to separate uh, the black and the white points. Uh, so this is uh, the very basic idea, the basic spirit of, of, of deep learning. So uh, uh, what you have is, is uh, your initial raw data that go uh, through successive layers of transformations and representations. And the goal of these successive uh, transformations is um, to, uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, a, a new representation of the data that is closer to the prediction uh, domain, the prediction task that you have to achieve. Um, what happens in these in this successive layers of, of uh, representation is that uh, extraneous information, information that you don't need is filtered out, useful information uh, is extracted uh, uh, so that you can be successful in your task. Um, and when I say that the, the internal uh, uh, transformations result in successive representations, I don't mean it in a, in, a, um, um, in, in a way that is not literal. You actually have uh, different representations of your original raw data. And you can see an example here, um, which is taking, again, a, a, an instance of an MNIST image, uh, in this case, a, a, a handwritten digit form. And in the successive layers, this uh, digit four is, is um, converted into different representations that become more and more abstract. So as you go uh, through the layers, it becomes harder and harder to recognize to the human eye that what you started with uh, was a digit four. But somehow these representations are actually useful uh, to the model itself in order to perform the task that we have given it. And the task here is to actually classify whether an image um, is coming from the class uh, 0, 1, uh, 2, and so on. OK. What would be extraneous information uh, in this case? Uh, for example, if the digit is slightly, slightly rotated or because of noise, there is some pixels that light up in the periphery of this image, uh, this could be extraneous information. So the model should learn uh, in these successive layers of representation to get rid of, of that extraneous useless information and, and pick up uh, the most salient features that, that are uh, useful for the task. So of course, probably you already understand that when I, when I say meaningful representation, this is a relative concept, right? Because what is meaningful always depends on the task at hand. So if we had, if we had a different task, so for example, if our task was not to, um, uh, to classify the digits, uh, but for example, uh, I don't know, to decide if a digit is handwritten or not, um, or maybe uh, to, uh, to denoise uh, uh, the digit, uh, then the features that would be useful would be completely different and the internal representations of the model would be completely different. So what is a meaningful representation we should always keep in mind that is, is relative to the task at hand. So where's the deep, where does the deep in deep learning, uh, is, where is it coming from? Um, it's coming from exactly this characteristic of, of those models that it's a multi-layered representation. So you go uh, deeper uh, and deeper in more abstract representations of your model. <clears throat> 
Okay. So I think there's a there's a hand up from Dania. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So maybe in the same lines, what is a meaningful transformation to yep. choose? How do you know? Or do you just try and see what works best? Or? Well, you don't have so. Uh, in, in the old days, let's say, of, of, uh, of machine learning, in the pre-deep learning days of machine learning, people had actually to engineer uh, what representations were, were useful, to engineer uh, features, for example, that were important for the model. But in this case, the only thing that you have to do is to specify an architecture for your model. You don't define what representation is useful, is useful or not. These representations, sorry. These representations that you see here are not representations that, that somebody uh, decided or designed by hand. These are representations that were uh, uh, decided by the model considering the task at hand, right? So, so the model did its best and we'll see how it actually does that in order to achieve its task, its classification task. And it decided that the most useful representations, uh, internal representations are the ones you see here. So you don't have to go through this process of deciding what a meaningful representation is. What you have to decide is your architecture of, of your model, and you have very, very importantly to decide uh, what is the, your objective, right? What is the task that you try to achieve? Because this is going to, uh, to be the arbiter of, of what is going to be used as an internal representation. And I think there was a question that I, I missed, but I guess it refers to the, the slide before from Sebastian, uh, who asked if there, there are some of the hidden parameters that cannot be accessed from different backends. No, uh, if um, we, no matter which which backend, I mean, I, I'm assuming that you that you're uh, working on a, spe on a specific backend, right? So if you're working with TensorFlow, for example. All the hidden parameters uh, are accessible. You can you can see what those hidden parameters are at the end, for example, of, of the model fitting. Um, I, I don't know if that is a question or if you move if you move from yes, one. Yes, I, I just wonder where the complexity come in, and um, and because it's an abstraction, the, um, the um, higher, highest level here us, and um, I wonder where there are sort of hidden parameters that you can tune, but you don't have access to it, if, if this exists. Yeah, okay. So um, if I understand correctly, yes, there are cases where uh, the wrappers are hiding from you uh, um, uh, useful design parameters of, of, uh, of the underlying infrastructure of the layer, and the only way to access them is to actually uh, do that uh, through uh, direct access to the TensorFlow backend. Mm -hmm. And you can do that when you're working on Keras. This does not prevent you, uh, at the same time, to access the underlying TensorFlow backend. Actually, uh, often this is a, a very useful thing to do, a mm -hmm. necessary thing to do. Mm, thanks. Okay. okay. So, how is actually the model trained? So, how, how are the uh, these parameters of the model? Uh, going to be uh, to be fitted. So, uh, as I mentioned here uh, before, uh, a very uh, important decision that you have to make is the loss function because this is going to uh, to measure the success of of your model uh, for the task at hand. So, for example, in the case of of image classification, um, the loss function is disagreement between your decision in terms of 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 the digit uh, that take that has the maximum probability, so the arc max of of the final output versus the actual uh, uh, the actual label that uh, that is actually given you know it uh, so that would be the loss function so uh, how do you fit uh, the, the parameters of, of the model so the, the the basic idea is that the parameters of the model uh, are uh, slowly updated towards a direction that provides an improvement relative to the loss function uh, the updates are done using uh, an algorithm that, that um, is known through the, uh, since the, the 80s, which is the back propagation algorithm and uh, the chain rule of, of uh, differentiation that uh, traverses the model from the tail to the end. So from the output towards the input. And uh, the main idea of the chain rule is that uh, you, can, um, uh, you can find out the gradient uh, 
of, of, uh, of a parameter um, uh, relative to, to the overall loss function if you already know the gradient of, uh, of, of a previous parameter relative to the loss function. Okay? So this allows you to traverse the model, uh, uh, the transpose of the graph slowly uh, towards, towards its head in order to update all the parameters. So for example, if in this simple model here that goes from input to output, you had to update uh, those parameters here, W1 and W2, uh, this would be uh, how, how you would do it. So you'd have to calculate uh, the gradients of those parameters relative to the loss model, assuming that you already knew um, uh, the gradient for, for, the subsequent, uh, for the subsequent parameters. Okay, so this is the basic idea. You, you, uh, you try to update the weights of the model towards the directions that provides an improvement relative to the loss function that you have, uh, that you have specified. Um, and for that, you use the backpropagation uh, algorithm in order to traverse the, the, the graph from the uh, output direction towards, towards uh, its input. The direction towards uh, which the parameters need to move is computed using uh, stochastic gradient descent. So basically what you're doing is that you calculate uh, 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 the gradients of, uh, of the parameters uh, uh, relative to the loss function again, so you you uh, you calculate the partial derivatives of of your parameters, and uh, you decide towards which direction you have to move. Um, you can take smaller and big or bigger steps towards that direction, and this is um, specified by a parameter that is typically called learning rate. This overall procedure of back propagating and updating uh, your weights using stochastic gradient descent is uh, performed by, uh, uh, by uh, constructs that are called optimizers in, in, uh, in Keras and, and in TensorFlow, okay? So the optimizers are, is the internal machinery that actually uh, performs this task of uh, backpropagating, back, back uh, calculating the gradients and updating the weights. Okay, and this loop is updated uh, many, many times using small splits of the data that are called uh, batches. So you don't see uh, all the data at once. You see the data in, in smaller batches, but uh, in every full loop of training, you have to see uh, all the data. So um, uh, you see many batches until you have seen everything and you do this many times. Uh, every complete loop through your whole data set is called an epoch. And you'll do this again several times until you reach convergence, that is until your weights do not change anymore. This is how you uh, update your weights. And you can see um, a, a schematic of, of how this process looks like uh, for, uh, two, uh, for two parameters, for parameters M and B. So the, the Z axis here is the loss. And you can see um, that uh, you, uh, you move in this, uh, in this optimization landscape, you move in this landscape, landscape defined by your two parameters M and B, trying to reach uh, minima in, in this uh, optimization landscape, okay? And you can understand, for example, that the step, the size of the step that you're going to take is an important parameter, because for example, if you have already reached the edge of this funnel and you try to find uh, the, the minimum, the global minimum here, if you take very large steps, you will keep maybe jumping around without ever reaching your global mean. All right. So there's a, there's a question from uh, Ludovic. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so how the model update, the model updates the weight per batches for one epoch. So uh, as I said, uh, every time that, that you see uh, a, a small batch of the data, um, the, 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 the dates are already, the, the weights are already updated. So you don't wait until you see the complete data set. Every time that you see a mini batch of your data, you update your weights. So in one epoch, in one uh, epoch, you will see your full uh, data set. But let's say that your data set has 5,000 samples and your batch is, is 500. You'll actually do uh, 10 uh, full back propagations uh, on your network. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can comment on that question. Um, um, I, in fact, I use sometimes the model and I have always hard time to understand the compromise between the number of batch to use uh, 
per epoch because for me it's hard to understand how the, the model will perform better if you have a huge let's say batch per epoch compared to a, to, to a low batch um, i don't know if i am clear yes you are okay perfect so um yes there, there is uh, there is a trade off uh, and there is a balance uh, basically between the the batch size that you're going to use and the learning rate if you use a small batch size uh, you can understand that that uh, the updates that you're going to have uh, are going to fluctuate a lot because you're going to get information only from a relatively small sample of your data. So if you have uh, a, a very a very large batch size, uh, you can actually increase the learning rate to learn faster because in every epoch you use a lot of you get information from a lot of data. If on the other hand you use small batches. Uh, then that means that you have a lot of fluctuation, a lot of jumping around because you, you, you because of the small sample size. So in that case, you would have to decrease your learning rate. So uh, basically, the 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 the, uh, the batch size. Uh, one of the impacts of the batch of the batch size is is how how much uh, uh, jumping around you do in the uh, optimization landscape. Is that clear? Yeah. Because for me, the, the batch size impact a lot also on the, I can imagine that, I mean, ideally you would like to have all the data uh, seen for one epoch like that you, you can really have, um, I mean, you can learn, um, it's slower in the learning process, I guess, because every epoch you will have to update, you will have an update only every epoch. So it's really slower, but I think it's performing better because you see more data, but it's really long. In the other hand, if you do a lot of batches, he will learn um, uh, faster, but maybe it's not good because you don't see uh, enough data each uh, for each batch. So my question is more: I have always hard time to to um, to tune this uh, this parameter. So maybe if you have some yeah. insight on that, or maybe it's so typically I decide on the batch size based on on my on my uh, memory constraints. Um, and depending on whether you, you're working, for example, with uh, with count data or with with uh, image data, there is only so much. Uh, and, and, you, and you're working on, uh, on GPUs, there's only so much data that you can fit on the GPU. So one important constraint that, that helps, that decides uh, uh, what is the batch size is basically what can the GPU memory fit. If the GPU memory uh, can fit uh, uh, all your data, then I think you, uh, you can also uh, use a batch size that is basically your complete data set size, as long as your learning rate is 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 big enough because if your learning rate is very small and you you have a huge batch size, your your convergence is going to be extremely slow. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. All right. So just to uh, finish this section on the introduction on TensorFlow keras and and deep learning. Um, why now all the hype? What spurred the revolution? So the um, the research on 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 uh, neural networks uh, started in 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 the early seventies. Um, uh, the basic algorithms like backpropagation, gradient descent were in place since the eighties. So what happened that 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 um, that suddenly? Um, uh, created this revolution of, of deep learning. And, and mainly, these were advances on three fronts. So the first front uh, was actually hardware advancement. So um, the ability to do massively parallel, parallel, parallel computation on, on GPUs mainly, and, and of course, now also on TPUs. The second front yeah, yeah, were improvements on, on the algorithms that, that are used. So um, robust uh, backpropagation, uh, that is able to train models with with, uh, uh, with many many uh, internal layers until relatively uh, recently this was not possible because of a problem that is called the, van the vanishing gradient problem which means that basically as you go from the end of the model towards the beginning of the model uh, the impact of, of the loss function on the parameters is, be is becoming smaller and smaller making it extremely hard to train models that have uh, uh, a lot of internal layers. Uh, there were also improvements on the optimizers. So now you have, as we see in the exercises, uh, adaptive op optimizers that decide, for example, on different learning rate per parameters, depending on on uh, on, on how they move on the uh, on the uh, uh, landscape of optimization. You have regularization techniques that uh, 
help you to avoid overfitting. So you have uh, uh, many things came together in terms of improved algorithms in a relatively short time that allowed you to, to, uh, to train uh, these uh, uh, models with a, a lot of internal layers. Finally, uh, uh, another important thing was the, the availability uh, of many high quality, uh, sometimes uh, labeled data sets. And this came because of the uh, uh, massive adoption, of, of course, of, of, of the web users, uh, but also advances in tech and instrumentation in the hard science. We get, you have um, uh, a lot of, of data coming from high energy physics and astrophysics and, of course, biology and so on. Uh, so you have also uh, a lot of available data sets to, to train your models. And so these were the three main things. And, and this kind of, uh, the, although it's kind of a chicken and an egg problem, this resulted also in improved architectures because there was so much interest uh, after the, the, uh, the first uh, big success of deep learning was demonstrated. A lot of interest turned into it. There were improved architectures. Uh, and then also development of uh, user-friendly platforms that uh, lowered the the threshold for somebody entering the field. Um, okay, and uh, I don't think I have to go into the success of success of deep learning. If anything, the, the field is, is overhyped, so I, I'm sure you have heard of, of, uh, of uh, many of those, but um, uh, pretty much uh, everybody's life is, is now touched by deep learning, uh, refined web searching, spam fraud and fraud detection. Um, you've seen uh, that, uh, uh, I'm sure you've seen examples where uh, machines can do near human image classification, near humans machine translation. You're probably using either DeepL or Google Translate. Um, machines can play uh, chess at a superhuman level uh, and also Go uh, using um, uh, basically no information uh, apart from the rules of the games. Um, so they don't even need expert games to be trained on, autonomous dri driving, natural language processing. But also, I'm, pro I'm pretty sure you've heard of, of many uh, clinical applications like um, uh, prediction of protein folding, medical image processing, drug design, and diagnostics. Just make a, a declaration about things that we're not going to talk about, things that you have probably uh, uh, heard, things that you may had a hope that you were going to cover here. But uh, as, as you understand, um, this is not. Um, uh, deep learning is not a topic that that uh, that uh, I can cover or I could cover in any case um, in 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 uh, in this time frame or in any time frame actually speaking for myself. Um, so there are a lot of things that uh, are not part of my expertise. I'm not using. I'm not familiar with. Um, or uh, some of things uh, I I do have some uh, knowledge about, but they're not of interest uh, in the in the present context. Um, and here I've ordered them in my perceived um, hierarchy of what is maybe most relevant uh, to transcriptomic analysis to less relevant. So on the top are maybe things that you would like to at some point uh, take a look into. So this is distributed uh, multi-GPU training, regularization techniques, we very briefly mentioned but didn't go in, into detail and we don't have time to go into detail about uh, different regularization techniques like the L1 and the tool. Uh, 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 regularization, how they are combined uh, between them and so on. Uh, how you can uh, construct custom layers by accessing directly the TensorFlow backend. Um, the batch normalization, which is uh, another technique that uh, 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 prevents overfitting, but most importantly, allows you to, to, uh, to reach much faster convergence rates in, in training. Uh, eager versus deferred execution, um, which is uh, two different um, uh, ways of of, uh, um, of uh, executing um, uh, the code in 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 Keras, in TensorFlow rather, not in Keras. Uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, geometric deep learning, recurrent layers, transitional models, reinforcement learning. These are uh, maybe things that many of you have heard of, um, uh, but uh, I don't think that uh, they are particular of particular. Uh, interest uh, at this point in, in transcriptomic analysis, uh, at least the last of those that I that I mentioned, um, unless uh, you know uh, somebody has an opposite uh, opinion or, or knows something that that I don't, which is quite possible, uh, and you can please uh, state your experience with those in transcriptomics. Okay. 
so before I go to the various of the encoders, I, I think it's it's uh, much easier if I start with uh, uh, explaining what an autoencoder is, uh, not a variational autoencoder because the architecture is a bit simpler. Uh, so what are autoencoders? Uh, they are uh, uh, supervised models. Um, so in that respect, they have the benefit of, uh, of uh, uh, having easy access to large training sets because you do not need label data. And the objective is to obtain a, an output that basically resembles as much as possible your original input. But this happens in, in a particular way. So what you do is that you get you start with your input and you start squeezing it more and more in, in successive uh, uh, lower and lower dimensional representations until you reach a bottleneck. And this bottleneck is typically referred to as, as a latent code. And then you start uh, uh, expanding, uh, blowing up again the, the, the dimensions uh, until you reach uh, the dimensionality of your original output. What is the training objective here? What is the loss function that we're trying to, to, to minimize? Uh, the training objective here is, again, to get an output that looks as similar as the input. So, so the, typically, the loss that is used is the reconstruction loss that measures the, the, uh, the distance of the reconstruction, the dissimilarity of, of your input and, and your output after you go through this process of squeezing the data and then expanding them back up again. Uh, what do you gain by, by this process? Um, uh, why do you want to do that? Well, the main thing is that uh, as you go through this process of, of squeezing the data more and more, while at the same time being able to reconstruct them, you force your model to only retain the most important features, the most salient features of, 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 your, of your input. Okay? So the, the, uh, the bottleneck here, the latent code, is, is a very concise uh, representation of your input uh, uh, a, a much more lower dimensional representation of your input that is still able to reconstruct something that more or less looks uh, like the original, your original data, but having set out a, a lot of, of, of um, uh, unimportant, a lot of, of uh, uh, non too important uh, details. The first part of, of the model that goes through the squeezing of the data is typically called an encoder. And the second part of the data that uh, blows up the dimensions again is the decoder. Uh, this this uh, um, nomenclature encoder and decoder is not specific to autoencoders. Uh, there are actually um, uh, many, many deep learning models that have an encoder decoder architecture. Um, uh, but yeah, in the context of, of, of the autoencoders, you also use the, the same nomenclature. Um, here I have a, a symmetric uh, architecture between the encoder and the decoder. So you can see that uh, here the number of nodes that you have in, in, the, in the hidden layers as you go from input to the bottleneck and from the bottleneck to the output uh, are, are symmetric. They are the same. So these two and these two and these two. But this is not a strict requirement. Um, it's it's uh, what people, people typically use, but there's absolutely no specific reason why the, the, the architecture should be symmetric. Um, and uh, as I said, the main advantage of this model is that uh, you, you learn a representation of, of your data that is given by the latent code, the representation in, in the very middle, the bottleneck, that very concisely represents the input. That's what I'm trying to capture here. So here is an original image uh, who has gone through, through this process of squeezing and re-expanding. Um, and this is the original image. This is the reconstructed image. You can see that the reconstructed image is basically a much more fuzzy version of the original one. Um, and the, the latent code here is, is of much uh, uh, lower dimensionality. Okay. So it has uh, 32. Um, it's of dimension 32 uh, here. And you can see what the, uh, the intensity of, of the, the of each of the 32 nodes of the latent code here. Uh, but this uh, uh, 32 dimensional uh, vector can uh, does a decent job, uh, not a great job, but a decent job of, of being able to reconstruct uh, the original image, which is of much higher dimensionality, right? Of what is it? This like 40 by 40 or something. And, and also has multiple channels. Okay. <clears throat> There are multiple uh, 
uh, variants of, of autoencoders, uh, deep stacked sparse variational denoising adversarial disentangle and so on. Um, today we're going to, to focus on the variational uh, uh, autoencoder um, uh, variant. But before we go into that, I'd like to talk a little bit about different applications of autoencoders. Uh, so autoencoders did not start with uh, uh, transcriptomics. Uh, they have been used uh, uh, for quite some time now in different tasks for dimensionality reduction and visualization. So here is another uh, example of using the MNIST dataset. And what you uh, uh, want to get here is a concise representation of the digits in the latent layer. You can use this, you can pass this latent layer to TSNI to obtain a visualization of your digits. Um, they have been used for denoising and completion. So here you can see an example of digit denoising on the top. You have a uh, different noisy version of the data. You can pass them through the autoencoder in order to, to denoise uh, the images. Uh, you can do uh, image completion. In this case, this is face completion, um, where here you have your input. You, you hide uh, from the trained model uh, different parts of, of, uh, of, the, of, of the face and the autoencoder is able to, to complete back uh, the faces. Uh, it has also been used for other uh, tasks like feature manipulation that are more inferential kind of, of, uh, um, uh, of uh, uh, applications. Um, like, uh, for example, here you have an original subject in terms of a picture and you want to infer how the same subject would use if you add a particular uh, facial feature, feature to it, like for example, glasses. Uh, so you can do that by uh, manipulating latent codes as we will also see in our example. Basically what you do is that you have um, uh, uh, a latent vector that corresponds to the face uh, without glasses. You add to this latent vector uh, a vector that corresponds to the facial feature that you want to add, in this case, the classes. And uh, the dot product of these two is going to give you, uh, in latent space, a face with classes. You can decode that back to give you a picture of how the, same, the face uh, would look with that particular facial feature. Uh, you can also slowly morph uh, from one type of, uh, of object to, to another. So you can traverse the, the latent space uh, in order to slowly uh, morph from one uh, 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 from one uh, point of a picture to, to, to a final point of a picture. In this case, you're just morphing a, a, a short chair to a, to a tall chair. Okay, so maybe you already see why, why this is um, a natural thing to, to use in, in single cell transcriptomics. Um, uh, single cell data are high dimensional, so, so you would, uh, there's a lot of interest in visualization. Uh, they're also very noisy uh, or corrupt data. They have um, uh, dropouts, large magnitude outliers. Um, so denoising is also of interest, but um, uh, I think to, to me, probably the most interesting application of, of, uh, um, of deep generative networks and, and uh, variational autoencoders in, in single cell data is actually the last um, application that is to try to do um, uh, uh, inference uh, on your data sets. Um, and we'll see what, what I mean by that uh, a bit later. So can I ask just a question? Uh... Yes, of course. Just to, to understand the, the, the denoising and completion in the context of autoencoder, for me, it's hard to see. Because for me, the, uh, the autoencoder is you have only one input, you have no training data. So how a noisy, because here your image is just noisy, how we can learn through the autoencoder to find back the, the um, let's say, the, 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 the right solution. I completely understand in the case of dimensionality reduction, but here it's, if you can just comment, maybe I missed something. Yeah. Okay, so uh, basically the idea, uh, the intuition here is that um, the, the, the pixels in the images are not uh, uncorrelated from one to the other, okay? And uh, in the case of, 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 of genes, these are also uh, not uncorrelated one to the other. So information about the neighborhood of pixels uh, can give you information about, about uh, a nearby neighborhood of pixels. So the fact that, um, um, I don't know, here you have uh, a lot of pixels that light up together, um, suggests that uh, it makes sense that, that uh, this should also light up, uh, this pixel that is black should also light up. That is, that is the, the high level intuition. So basically what you encode in the autoencoder, what the autoencoder learns is, is relationships between the pixels. Uh, but I should add one more thing here that, that uh, uh, in many um, 
applications where you specifically want to learn a denoising of the encoder, what you do is that um, in, your, in your input data, you actually add a, a noise, um, different types of noise, like, like a salt and pepper noise in, in your data. Uh, and what you measure in terms of reconstruction is, is the ability of, of the output uh, to reconstruct the, 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 the picture before you added the noise. So basically, during the training, the, 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 the model learns how to, how to filter out noise and how to complete. So basically, the autumn could have resolved the equation by adding the parameters that you have defined at the beginning. I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, the way that you, that you put it, but uh, if I can summarize it again. Uh, I there, OK. Is, is it clear for everyone? Or maybe I can explain again. Okay. Uh, if I can, uh, yes. I have maybe a related question about the phase completion. I mean, I, I'm really impressed by the second line mm. where uh, the program uh, guess, uh, I, I mean, know how to build the, the eyes of the guy. Mm. Um, does it mean that he, it uses this um, correlation between the, the images to know what are how are uh, defined the eyes? It uses a complete set of of, of uh, face images that you have shown in order to, uh, to to somehow infer that you when you have a particular uh, a, a, a structure in terms of 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 of, of pixel intensity and and, and pixel uh, um, pattern, uh, then you should expect. Uh, uh, something uh, in particular. So for example, when you have something that looks like a nose, you would expect that on top of it should be something that looks like eyes and not something that looks like a, like a mouth. Why the eyes um, uh, are, uh, are, are there, or like the eyebrows are the li right color, for example, this um, uh, you can learn or you can infer by, by looking, for example, at the, at the color of the, of the hair. I should point out here that, that the model that, that is used here in order to do face completion uh, is, not, uh, the, the very, is not similar to the very simple um, uh, model that we showed earlier where we flattened out the images. It's a, it's a model that actually uses uh, convolution. So it takes advantage of, of the 2D uh, structure of the image of the correlations between neighboring pixels. So it's a, it's a much richer model, model in terms of its representation. Uh-huh, okay, <laughs> thank you. So in, in the context of an autoencoder, you can also use convolutions. I, again, uh, I'm not, I don't have the time to go into detail, but convolution, uh, uh, convolutional networks give you a, a, a way to, to take advantage, to, to capture uh, uh, this, this, uh, these types of, of uh, correlations uh, that, that exist typically in images between the neighboring pixels. Okay. <clears throat> I said that there are many different versions of autoencoders. Um, um, what are you trying to do? What is the, the, the goal of, of these different um, of these different autoencoder flavors? And rather, uh, actually, what is the, the goal of, of, of any uh, deep learning model is to actually get a good code representation. Like we said, the, what what meaningful or a good representation means uh, it's 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 very dependent on the specific task. Um, but this is um, this is a task where we actually try to, to reconstruct uh, uh, the input. So, so how, we define, how, how do we define goodness of a representation? So there are several criteria. Uh, so one of the things is that it has to, re to be robust to meaningless input corruptions. Um, this is related to the question that came earlier um, uh, about how the, the model learns uh, to do uh, phase completion or to do denoising. Uh, you try to construct a model that is uh, robust to such uh, uh, noisy inputs. Uh, so basically what you try to do to learn is to learn a representation that here it's, uh, um, it's, it's uh, depicted by uh, this, this, this curve here, uh, that when you give a point that is outside the curve is going to collapse it back to the curve, where the curve represents um, uh, the possible, uh, the, the, um, the manifold that actually generates the data, that gives rise to the data. Okay, so it has to be robust. It has to be generalizable. That means that it can transfer to multiple settings of uh, related problems. Uh, that means that if you train the model on, on a specific set of images or faces, um, 
uh, for example, let's say of, of, uh, of uh, uh, phases of, of Caucasians, and then you move to phases of, of African Americans. How are you going to do? Are you going to do uh, well? Are you are you able to generalize? Uh, are you able to to, to generalize if if uh, the the phases are slightly uh, uh, rotated or a little bit out of focus, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> so it has to, to to be a model that is uh, that can transfer to to a multiple centics related problems. It has to be a, a model that gives you a smooth or coherent uh, um, a, a latent representation. Uh, that means that when you, you give similar inputs, you should obtain similar codes. Uh, you should not have big jumps in the representation when you have small jumps in the input, okay? And finally, uh, sorry, it should be explanatory. Uh, that means, uh, um, that uh, ideally the different uh, uh, dimensions of, of your latent code should somehow correspond to, to real world uh, uh, explanatory variables of, of, uh, of your data that are generated. So for example, if you have a latent code that has um, uh, one dimension corresponding to the smile, uh, one to the skin tone, and one to the gender, and one to the beard, this is excellent, right? Because it gives you uh, uh, a very easy way to, 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 to obtain a mapping between the latent variable and uh, 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 physical um, and, and, um, and features that have a, a clear physical interpretation. Okay, <clears throat> so what are variational autoencoders? It's like I said, an extension of, of uh, the basic autoencoder design that, that, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the main idea here is that uh, 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 variational autoencoders uh, generalize autoencoders by adding stochasticity. So the latent layer here does not generate point estimates, does not generate uh, uh, a, 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 a single uh, value that, co that corresponds to, to uh, a specific latent feature. It actually uh, uh, generates uh, distributions. So uh, every uh, latent dimension is going to, to, to be a distribution with a particular mean and a particular variance which is sampled before you go uh, to the decoding. Uh, why, uh, what do you gain by, by doing that? Uh, uh, several things. First of all, you encourage a more continuous latent manifold. That, that means that uh, you encourage to, to uh, uh, representations that do not have these discontinuities that, uh, that uh, we mentioned earlier. Um, you get uh, models that are more robust and, and typically have uh, valid decoding. That means that um, if you um, try to sample uh, from from a, from uh, an area that you uh, did not, uh, where you did not have uh, originally a lot of training examples, it's much more probable that you'll get something that uh, that is sensible rather than something that is uh, completely um, uh, unnatural. And finally, and probably most importantly, uh, because um, it is a generative model, uh, it, it estimates the generative distribution of the data. Uh, this generative distribution is the final distribution learned by the, by the latent code. Uh, the latent distribution, it allows interpolation and exploration. Um, and this is probably the most interesting characteristics, the characteristics of the virus node encoders. So how do you actually train uh, such an autoencoder? What is the, the, the loss function? Uh, what we had before in the normal autoencoder was just the reconstruction loss, which is showcased here, uh, which just measures the discrepancy between the input and your output. What you add to the variational autoencoder uh, loss function is, is a distance to a, to a latent prior. So you assume that uh, you have a prior uh, distribution uh, for your latent distribution, and this is a multivariate normal distribution with a, with a unit covariance matrix, so, so uh, uncorrelated uh, dimensions. Uh, and uh, uh, along with the reconstruction loss, you measure your distance to the latent prior. So there is a balance here. There is a balance between how well you do the reconstruction and how far you weigh, uh, how far away you move from your prior. Okay, you cannot uh, uh, move too much. Uh, uh, farther away fr from, from the prior, from, from the uh, multivariate normal prior, because you're going to take a hit in your loss function. You can also uh, not do uh, terrible, terribly in the, in the reconstruction because you're going to take a hit in the reconstruction part of the loss. Um, this second part, uh, you can actually see as a, as a, uh, as a tunable uh, parameter. 
as a tunable regularization parameter, you can, you can tune how much of an impact you want it to have on the final loss function. When beta is, is equal to one, um, then you have the, a, a vanilla variational encoder, the, the, the most classical variational encoder, and this whole loss is referred to as the evidence lower bound. When you have a beta that's lower to one, uh, that means that you give more weight to the reconstruction. Okay, uh, it's more important to get a better reconstruction than to get uh, something that is close to the to the latent prior. And when you get a beta that is greater than one, then you do the opposite. You give more uh, um, uh, you give more attention to, to this part of the loss, uh, more weight to this part of the loss. So you're trying to get something uh, that is doing okay in the reconstruction, but but more importantly. Is, is closer to the prior that you have specified. Um, what you choose depends on the application. Why, for example, would you choose uh, uh, to go with a large beta, so to, to, to design a what is called a disentangling autoencoder? Well, if, if you specify a large beta, that means that you, you, you try to be uh, uh, as close as possible to the, to the multivariate a normal prior that has a unit covariance matrix. Why is that important? Because um, uh, that, that implies that, that the dimensions of, of the latent code are uncorrelated, which means that the features that the latent code is going to capture are also going to be uncorrelated. That's why, or, or, or at least uh, mostly uncorrelated. That's why these are called disentangling in all the coders, because they, they, they try to, to disentangle your, uh, uh, the, the latent code in things that are orthogonal to each other or mostly orthogonal to each other. Any questions? Am I going too fast? Um, I think there is a question yeah. by Don, yeah. Yes. Do you want to ask yourself? Yes. So uh, in the latent space, if you have distributions now, um, can you apply something like a Gaussian graphical model to know the dependencies or the conditional dependencies between the different um, dimensions in the latent space? I don't know if, if that makes sense to, if you know what each um, um, latent node can means and, and, and you want to know how they're related to each other. Okay, so you would like to recover the covariance matrix um, of, of, of the latent distribution, right? Yeah. So this is not explicitly enco encoded in the model, the, the covariance matrix, um, and I'm not certain uh, how to do this, um, but uh, I can look it up and, and, and try to answer this, but I'm not sure how to do this. Okay, so various auto encoders in, in single cell data. Um, basically, you have the same architecture as we had uh, before. So you have uh, this particular uh, uh, design where you go from uh, your original space. In this case, we're talking about uh, uh, the gene space. So every sample is a vector of, or a vector of, of, of gene counts. That, that's your input data, sorry, of input data. And you go uh, through, uh, successive compressions of, of, of this in initial data. Uh, you have, in the case of variational encoders, this, this latent uh, layer that you ne next need to sample in order to go through the decoder. And what you end up with is, again, uh, back to the original dimension of, of the gene space. <clears throat> so what you uh, end up with, for example, for, for different samples, for different cells, that is, uh, of, of uh, a trained variational autoencoder is with a, latent, um, uh, uh, with a latent layer that can give you a very uh, succinct uh, um, summaries of, of, uh, uh, of, your, of your sample, of your cell in the latent space. So here, for example, uh, I have um, different uh, cells. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I highlight uh, what, what is shown here is, is how much a, each one of the, of the latent dimensions lights up for a particular sample okay, in the final trained model. What you also get is a model that is able to do uh, uh, denoising or imputation in the original, on the original data. So you should all 
uh, be familiar with type of of, of typical uh, picture between uh, uh, the 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 relationship uh, between the counts in two uh, different cells of a single cell data set where you have a lot of dropouts in one or the other cell you have uh, some uh, large magnitude outliers and uh, even if the cells are, are extremely similar so if, if you have cells that are, should be of the same type you end up with this with this picture that is that's actually very far away from what you'd expect from from uh, two related bulk RNA sec data sets this is how the same uh, cells look like in, in the in the imputed in the in the denoised version of the data. So after the data have gone through end to end from input to output on a trained model, uh, where you can see that you uh, pretty much have have gotten rid of, for example, of, of all the the dropouts. Now, to what degree this imputation is is the truth um, um, is, is 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 very hard to to judge. Uh, but I, I would say that I trust I would trust these imputations much more than any, uh, for example, uh, nearest neighbor uh, based imputation uh, that is basically uh, a, a, a poor man's uh, nonlinear uh, uh, version of, of imputing data. Um, you can see the, the the large impact that that uh, that this process has on our data by, by uh, looking at the mean uh, variance profile of our data set. And this is actually that is something that we're going to go through in the, in the exercise. Uh, so uh, this is the mean variance trend of the original data set. Um, uh, in the mean variance trend, uh, I'm, I'm sure most, most of you are familiar with it. Uh, in the x-axis, we have the, the, uh, the gene expression. In the y-axis, we have a measure of the variance uh, <coughs> of the genes. And typically in single cell data, what you have is, is uh, uh, a picture that gives you, uh, that shows over dispersion relative to the, to the uh, Poisson, uh, um, uh, to, the, to the picture that you would expect if you had uh, Poisson uh, distributed data, where the only source of variance is the sampling variance. Um, and you have also a very strong relationship between the, the mean gene expression and, and, and the variation. So the, the, the higher the gene expression, the lower uh, the coefficient of variation, right? Because you get um, better and better uh, estimates as, as the genes uh, increase in, a, in level of expression. Uh, so this type of picture is, is driven partially by the sampling variance, or most importantly by the sampling variance, uh, but it's also over dispersed to, to Poisson because there are also other sources of, of, vi of variance, like for example, there's biological variance, but there are also sources of, of uh, uh, um, of imperfections of, of artifactual measurements that are kind of unrelated to the sampling variance. This is the, the picture that you get uh, uh, when you um, uh, when you denoise the data. So in the final denoise data set, where you can see that um, uh, you have lost pretty much any relationship between the mean gene expression and the coefficient of variation. That means that that. Uh, Basically, any source of variance that, that is because of, of, of sampling is gone. All right, so so the, 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 auto, the variation autoencoder, what it tries to do is to give you back the noise measurements, measurements that are free of, of the variance uh, that mainly comes from the sampling variance, but also of, of artifactual uh, measurements. This is similar to the idea that you saw earlier in images where, where you would try to uh, complete or to denoise uh, pictures that you had added artifactual noise. Any questions? Okay. Um, there has been. Um, a, a there is one question. One yes, raised yes, hand. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit uh, late, but uh, I had a question about the training of these auto encoders. Yes. This central part, does it mean that you can still use the same typical propagation, backward propagation for, for weights? Absolutely. It, yes, it, it's not a problem. Okay. It is not a problem at all, yes. So, so okay. it's, it's the same type of, of, uh, of optimizers that you would use for a standard autoencoder that you use also in the variation autoencoders. There's, there's nothing different in terms of, of the fitting of the model. Okay, thank you. Every layer is, is uh, still differentiable. It's, it's still uh, uh, a type of layer that, that, the, um, uh, that the optimizers can work with. 
um, so in, in the past few uh, years, I would say maybe, I don't know, two, three years, um, maybe two years, uh, there's been a, a, an explosion of, of papers that, that uh, uh, basically uh, try to apply um, uh, autoencoders and or variational autoencoders in, in, in for different applications in, in single cell data. Uh, I don't have the time to, to go uh, through, through those. I just show some, some examples here. So you have applications of autoencoders where the goal is to denoise, so to do uh, uh, what you mentioned earlier, imputation of the data, um, to for visualization, um, and clustering, uh, because you can use, for example, the latent layer as, as, a, as a low D representation that you can use as input to clustering techniques. Um, uh, batch effect removal, you can do batch effect removal, as we will see in the exercise, by doing operations in the, in the latent space, um, uh, and, and, and so on. Okay, so these are just a few examples, uh, probably examples of, of that got a lot of visibility. Uh, when they were published. There is another question. Yes. Yeah, good question. Why why would you rely more on those approach compared to CNN for uh, denoising data? To, to CNN? Yeah. To you, CNN? Oh, oh, no, KNN. I'm K nearest neighbors. Ah, you mentioned KNN. Okay. Yes, yes. yes. No, not, yeah. Yeah, not convolution on the networks. I was talking about uh, K nearest neighbors. Because k-nearest neighbors is basically oh, it's it's also a, a non-linear kind kind of approach for for, for doing uh, uh, imputation, but but by construction it only can only take uh, into account a, a very uh, um, a limited uh, neighborhood of your data. It doesn't have the global picture that that uh, a, a well-trained variational encoder has, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, you can end up with a variational encoder that is trust if, if you have not. Uh, if it's extremely shallow, if it's extremely, uh, it has it has very uh, poor representation. If you have chosen, for example, a latent layer that has only two nodes, it, it, uh, it's the the, uh, the model is not going to be very expressive. But if you if you have done reasonable choices in terms of the architecture of your model, I, I think um, you'll do a better job. Okay, no, because I saw that this proximity of cells will, uh, in a way. Uh be really important to take into account. It, it is, and it will be taken into account by, by the variational autoencoder. But but uh, but um, like I said, um, because uh, during training you have seen everything, you have seen all your data. It has a more global picture of picture of of how genes, for example, uh, are, are correlated in your data set. It doesn't it doesn't have this very limited picture of of a neighborhood. Okay. okay. Thank you. Problem. Okay. Um, I will very, very quickly uh, mention uh, generative adversarial networks because um, uh, although they haven't been applied so extensively in single cell data, it's, it's um, uh, another uh, category of, of, of uh, um, generative networks. Uh, the idea here is, is in terms of, of, uh, of the training uh, of, of the loss function is completely different. Um, so you don't have anything like uh, a prior distribution, like in the case of, of, of uh, the variational autoencoder. What you have is, is a model that has two components. You have a generator uh, component that is uh, shown here, and you have a discriminator component that is shown here. So what happens is that uh, you start with a generator that basically uh, uh, produces a, a, a random, uh, a random data, uh, but of the same dimensionality as, for example, your, your, your cells. So it produces uh, random values, it spits out random values of, of, of uh, gene expression. And then you have a discriminator that tries to decide whether this, this, this sample that was generated by the generator is actually a real sample or not. Okay. So if the discriminator is doing a, a great job here, that means that the, the samples that are, spit, uh, that are spit out by the generator have nothing to do, they look nothing like uh, a, a, real, uh, a real cell sample. But, uh, but uh, as the model is being trained, uh, 
And uh, what you're trying to do is, is to actually uh, uh, trick the discriminator, is to actually uh, uh, make the discriminator confuse samples that are, that are produced by the generator versus the real samples. The better you are able to, to treat the discriminator, to, to trick the discriminator, the, the better job the generator is doing in terms of producing things that look like real cells, in this case, if we're talking about, about uh, transcriptomics. And that is the, 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 the idea, that is the loss function that, that you're using in order to train the model. You're trying to, to produce a generator that's going to, to uh, be able to trick your discriminator. And if you're able to do that, then that means that you have estimated a latent space that is a good approximation of, 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 of the space that gives generation to your actual data. This is what I'm trying to, to show here. You, so you have your uh, uh, initial uh, uh, distribution of your generator that looks like this. You have um, your real distribution that looks like this. And during the training, uh, you move your, your uh, latent space distribution closer and closer to the real uh, distribution until the two hopefully overlap. And you end up with a latent space representation that is able to give rise to data that look almost uh, uh, identical to, to the real data. Um, Generative adversarial networks are notoriously unstable. Uh, they're, they're hard to, to, to train. Uh, they suffer from what is known as the mode collapse, uh, which basically leads to some particular subsets of, of the data being overrepresented and other missing. However, uh, as, as many applications, particularly in image processing, have shown, they're able to generate high realistic, highly realistic fake samples. So probably if, if you have seen these examples of, of uh, deep fakes in videos and, 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 and images that uh, can trick you in terms of, of believing that something uh, of a face uh, is, is real, uh, a face that never existed is real, or they try to, to morph um, one actor to another and so on, these typically use uh, generative adversarial networks. Okay, <clears throat> so not so many applications in, in single strand transcriptomics, but there are a few. Uh, and, and this is one that's actually playing to the, to the strengths of, of the GANs, which is to actually generate uh, a, a realistic like data. So this is an application that tries to use GANs for augmentation of single cell RNA sequencing data using uh, generative adversarial networks. So an example that I show here. And I'm going to close the presentation with uh, um, some uh, observations about um, uh, what, what again I think is, is the most uh, interesting uh, aspect of, 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 uh, of uh, um, generative networks in transcriptomics, which is again that the latent uh, representation is an estimation, an estimation of the underlying uh, um, um, uh, distribution uh, um, that gives rise to the data. Um, so, uh, in other words, the, the latent space uh, can be viewed as, as a representation of, of uh, the transcriptional landscape, as, as uh, a representation of the landscape that uh, is able to give rise to the, uh, the different cells uh, that you have in your data set. This is a, a picture that the biologists have, have, uh, are, are familiar with uh, for more than 60 years. So uh, this very closely corresponds to the idea of a Waddington uh, uh, landscape, uh, which basically says that there is a particular uh, uh, topology uh, that uh, the cells can, can uh, traverse or they can, can go uh, 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 down to during differentiation. This is uh, the, from the original, um, uh, publication from, from Waddington. This is a more uh, modern, updated version of, of the same intuition, of the same notion, where you have uh, the cells going through different paths in, in a differentiation topology uh, and ending up in, in different uh, parts of this topology. So, so this, is, uh, this is not an idea that, that should be uh, strange to, to biologists, that you can, you can um, view um, uh, 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 transcriptome, uh, uh, transcriptome regulatory landscapes as an actual uh, 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 space, as an actual manifold, okay. where, where you can place your, yourself. And <clears throat> what's the, 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 the advantage of, of having such a representation? Well, if you had uh, uh, 
a, a good estimation of this uh, generative process of, of your data, then you can do uh, uh, inference. And, and what would be some examples of doing inference on such manifolds? Um, you can, for example, in, uh, infer transcriptomes upon biological perturbations. So you, you can ask questions like, uh, how would the cell look like if, if I, I, I perturb a particular gene? How, how would the, the rest of the genes be affected by, by such a perturbation? Um, you can infer the effects of perturbation in different cell uh, tissues of context. So if, if you have seen what, uh, what a gene uh, knockout or a gene overexpression has done in 30 different uh, cell types, can you infer what, what it would do in, in cell type 31? Or if you have seen what a particular perturbation is doing in, in, uh, in, in the muscle cells of human, can you maybe infer what the same perturbation would do in the muscle cells of, of a chimpanzee? And finally, can you infer trajectories? Can you ask uh, what would be must, my most likely trajectory if I want to start from point A in this, in this manifold, in this landscape, and I want to end up in point B? Can I do that? Can I get all the intermediate uh, um, um, states of that cell that would be a, a, an approximation of the, of the, of the physical reality? If, if you have actually uh, estimated uh, the manifold correctly, then this would be, in principle, be possible, right? And this is actually what um, uh, 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 these papers ha have tried to do. This is a paper coming from the lab of Fabian Tice. Um, the name of tool is SGEN. It's, it's, it, was, it, it was exactly trying to do this, to predict uh, single cell perturbation responses either uh, in different cell types where you have the, seen the perturbation in, in a specific subset of cells and you want to predict it in another one that is unseen, uh, or you want to predict how the perturbation would look like across species, for example. And this is uh, uh, somewhat similar work, but this is using generative adversarial networks to do it. Um, and again, what is trying to do, uh, what uh, uh, the authors were trying to do was to predict uh, single cell perturbations. 